Hey everyone, welcome back to our channel. In this video today, Rohit and I are gonna cover consulting math. But before we go into that, I'm Neil and I work at Bain as an associate consultant right now. And I'm Rohit and I work as an ACI. Uh, that basically means like an intern. And the reason Rohit and I are making these videos and making this channel in general is because we came from a non-target school. So it was kind of hard, I would say pretty hard for us to figure out all of the things that we need to know when going through the consulting process. And so we wanna make this channel as the one place that you need to go to to get all your questions answered. Our hope is that you feel confident and comfortable when going through the entire recruiting process for the big three firms. But anyway, that's enough of that. Let's get into the video of consulting math. So we're gonna split this into three sections. The first section is why math is important, both when you're in consulting and for the case interview. The second part is just general guidelines on how to be good at math when you're going through the casing process. And then finally, the third thing is the specifics, tips and tricks that me and Neil would use when we're going through uh, the case. Yeah, exactly. So let's dive into the first thing, which is why is being good at math important for both case interviews? And then also why is it important for on the job? And then also what kind of math can you expect to be getting tested on or having to use? And so kind of going with the first question, the first two questions are, are intertwined. The reason it's important to be good at math in the case interview is because it's, a, it's important to be good at math on the job. When you're an actual consultant, and maybe Rohit, you can testify with your couple weeks of experience, you've probably seen this already, that consultants use math a lot. And a lot of the math that we use is, is usually in, in somewhat time sensitive situations where we're trying to find the estimates or like revenues or percentage of something in a pretty quick situation. So for example, if you're talking to an expert in the automotive market, that expert could give you the number of cars that a company that might be private makes in a year. And so if you know the average price of that company's cars, then you can find out their revenues per year and then see if that matches the estimates that you had made previously or your gut feeling. And so because you're able to do those numbers quickly, although this is a pretty simple case, I would say, it can help you further the conversation in a way that you wouldn't have been able to if you had to either take out a calculator or wait till the end of the meeting to figure out, to add up or multiply the numbers, you know? And, and so the math that consultants expect you to know is not like linear algebra or calculus or, I don't know, trigonometry. Yeah. It's more so just addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, uh, and also probably percentages. And I think that as consultants, a lot of the value that we bring is in the data and insights with data that we provide. Oftentimes, we can either provide companies with data that they haven't seen before because we're able to go do market sizings or gather data from the internet that they didn't have time to go see or we can provide them different perspectives on the data that they already have. And so being good at math is important for two reasons in this regard. The first one is if you're better at math, then you're probably gonna be able to do a lot of these activities both quicker and also come to better insights because you're able to use the data better. And then the second one is after you've come to a first draft or when you're putting the, the deck or the final project together, the fact that you're good at math and estimating can help you pressure test a lot of the numbers that you've come to that you're showing the client, you know? So you're able to quickly say like, okay, like the, we're showing them these numbers, do they make sense? Do they not make sense? Why or why not, you know? Whereas if you, I think we're a little slower, or just like not as comfortable with numbers, it would be an unnatural thing for you to do, or at least something that you have to do with the calculator and thus be a little bit slower with it. I actually have an example of this from last week where uh, my team and I were sitting on this call with a client mm -hmm. and the manager on our case was quickly able to go through numbers like saying things like, oh, this is 40% of that, this is about 15% of this, and so these numbers to make sense, they check out. And so we were really able to cut to the meat of what we were trying to get to in that call really fast because the manager was able to pressure test numbers, check errors, things really quickly. So that's kind of the end of the first part of us trying to answer the questions of why is it important to be good in math, both for casing and then also on the job, and then what kind of math you can expect. We didn't want to spend too much time on it because we thought if y'all have stuck around and watched all of our videos and stuck this far into this video, you probably understand that math is already important anyway. But just to, just to solidify that point, we wanted to cover why it's important, especially on the job, so that you understand why you need to be good at math. But anyway, we'll go into the next part. Mm -hmm. So the second part is just general guidelines that you want to keep in the back of your mind if you're on a case or if you're going through the casing process. And the first general guideline that kind of has helped me the most is overviewing the math with the interviewer in the case. So for one example, if you're going through a market sizing case, you want to lay out all the things that you want to consider before actually putting in the numbers and overview the math with the consultant before mm -hmm. actually putting in the numbers and multiplying things and adding things. Yeah, for sure. It's almost like you're looking at the final number that you're coming to as the result of a long equation. So, I mean, a simple example could be the number of coffee cups sold in the US, right? You're probably gonna start with the 
I guess I need to go this way. You probably are going to start with the American population, and then you're going to look at the number of people in different categories of heavy coffee drinkers, light coffee drinkers, and medium coffee drinkers. And then you're going to multiply those two together to get the number of people in each category. And then you're going to multiply the number in each category times the number of cups they drink, right? And then that you add all those up and that gets you the number. But before you actually dive into the math, the point that Rohit brought up of overviewing your math with the consultant that you're working on the interview with is super important. And the reasons are because, well, for two reasons. One, if you've ever sat on the other end of an interview with a case, even if you're just casing your friend, and they start going into the math, you're like, man, I don't know if this person's going in the right direction or the wrong direction. Am, am I gonna just sit through this five minutes of them doing this market sizing to come to the wrong number because they didn't do the right process? And then two, it shows them that you're so comfortable with doing things like a market sizing and thinking through all the components quickly, such that you can even, before taking time to think about it, overview it with them. You know, So that's something that shows a lot of prowess, I think, with market sizing or just working with numbers, and then also something that's really client friendly. And then the next, the second point that we wanted to mention in terms of the broad guidelines when doing math in a case is knowing the units that you're solving for. And I think this ties into the first thing that Rohit mentioned of overviewing your math. I come from an engineering background, so thinking of numbers in terms of units is super natural, but I know for other people who might not have gone through an engineering major, it might not be as natural, but this is probably the number one thing that I stress to people who I give feedback to when I case with them is that they messed up on the market sizing because they didn't focus on the, the units that they were solving for. For example, I can go back to the coffee example I used. If you're doing a market sizing on the market size of coffee in the US, you need to know, are you solving for the number of cups per year? The number of cups sold in the last five years, the revenue that is generated from coffee, you know, like each of those things will constitute a different market sizing. And so you need to be really specific and crystal clear on the exact units of what you're solving for before you can dive into any math or any market sizing. So knowing your units for what you're solving is incredibly important. I, I actually can't stress that enough. It's, it's really important. And the third guideline that we want to talk about is if you're taking a long time, on a certain math portion. One, that might mean that you're doing something wrong, but that's a maybe. But what you wanna do in this situation is maybe take a step back and think if there are any shortcuts that you could use that would make the math a lot easier. Um, because the case is generally designed to be done in 30 to 40 minutes, so they don't want you spending all your time doing math work. Mm -hmm. So generally, you're probably missing a shortcut or probably doing something wrong if you're really, really into the weeds and the math. Yeah, for sure. But a way that you can avoid getting into a situation like that is by overviewing the number. So using tip one, you know, by doing that and confirming with the consultant that you're working with on the interview, hopefully you won't run into this situation of of spending too much time. And, and then the fourth guideline that we want to talk about is always speaking to your numbers. It is important that once you get to the number, of course, that you have the right number, but it's even better and shows, a, I guess, the characteristics of a really good caser if you can relate that number back to the broad problem that you're trying to solve and showing your own opinions of, you know, like so far looking at this number, this seems like a good deal, whatever it might be for the case. Or it could be like, oh man, this, this number isn't that hopeful. You know, like just looking at this number, it doesn't look that great, but let's continue on because I think there could be other factors that help it out, you know? So just being able to take a moment once you get to the number to almost do like a mini recommendation of what that number means for the broader case can really show that you're not just someone who's good at math, but someone who can talk to the numbers that they get to, which is actually a really good trait of people who are early on in their consulting career. Yeah, I guess one really good example of this is like, if you have a company that does a billion in revenue and you come to a figure that's like, oh, their profitability is a million in revenue. One good thing you could say is like, oh, you know, a million dollars is a lot of money, but at the same time, like a million dollars is only 0.1% of their entire <laughs> yeah, revenue. Yeah, so not a lot for so, that. Yeah, yeah if, you, if you tell them like, oh, it's 0.1%, like that shows that you can put numbers into context, even yeah. when they seem larger. And I guess even to take Rohit's example a step further, that might be an alarm for you of like, oh, 0.1%, let me make sure I didn't do anything wrong. So you could even literally say to the interviewer, hey, like this number seems super low considering the revenue number. So what I'm gonna do is just quickly make sure that I didn't have any missteps so that I know that we're coming to the right profit number. Because if I'm off by even a zero, that's a huge percentage point, right? Of like going from 0.1% to 1%, even though they're still both pretty small, like that's, that's a huge difference, right? So being able to talk to the numbers, talk to what they mean for the broader case, and then also even talk to if they seem a little off or not, and then using that as impetus to recheck your work before the person who's interviewing you tells you like, hey, like Rohit, are you sure that number is right? Like, if you hear that, then that, that's kind of like a worrisome sign and, and can be pretty nerve wracking in the middle of an interview. And then so the last guideline that we wanted to talk about was how to estimate and adjust numbers 
But the thing is there, we found another video that talks about that a lot better than we could in our video. So we figured we'd just link it down below. So down below, we've linked a video that goes pretty in depth into how you should estimate and adjust numbers so that when you're dealing with really big and scary numbers, you can handle them pretty quickly and also pretty accurately. So again, the link down below is there. Go check that one out. And finally, the last section of this video is going to be the specific tricks that me and Neil used when we were casing. And we really recommend that you use these because it has helped us a ton yeah. while going through the casing process. Yeah. And we're sure it'll help you too. The first thing is don't use zeros in large numbers. So for example, when you're writing out a million, don't put one and then six zeros oh, on God, your paper. Yeah, please don't do that. <laughs> please don't do that. Just, just write down like one M or one K or five K. Uh, it'll help you save a lot of time is one. And it also help you reduce the number of errors you make while you're doing the math. And then the next thing is to always write down the units on your numbers. And the reason for this is because the, I've been through many cases where there are a ton of numbers and I think I know what unit each number has, but then when I come back 10 minutes later, I have no idea if that was like, I don't know, the profit, or if uh, going back to Neil's earlier example, if it was like the cups per year, or cups per five years, like I wouldn't know. And so I think it's a great practice to always put down the units after the numbers, just because it'll help you keep track of everything. And even though it's longer, it'll definitely be worth it. Yeah, for sure. The second trick that we wanted to mention was to make the math easier on yourself. So this is a little bit more abstract, not as tactical as the first one that Rohit mentioned. But um, I think this is one, a tip that will help you make less mistakes. And then two, one where you can actually stand out and kind of separate yourself from other people who try to make the math easier for them. So I'll give you an example. One common place where people try to make the math easier from this, themselves pretty universally is in estimating the number of days in a year or even the number of people who live in the US. So. The days in the year, obviously everyone knows that's 365, but a lot of people will estimate it to be 300. But the way that they might approach that is saying, hey, can I instead use 300 instead of 365 because it's easier. But the, a better way that I think you can go about it is by saying, hey, I'm gonna try to use 300 instead of 365, both because of the easier math, but then also because of you know whatever it might be in your case that might make it reasonable for you to lower the numbers, like the number of holidays, the number of weekends, whatever it might be. And then also if you're doing like a market sizing or trying to find the revenue, you can say like, I also want to use 300 instead of, instead of 365 because that'll get us to a more conservative number. So if we come to the final number and it's a little low, then we could potentially even multiply, increase it by one sixth because we just decrease the number of days in a year by 65, you know, out of the 365. And so showing the interviewer that not only are you trying to make the math easier for yourself, but you're also thinking of the implications of how you making the math easier on yourself will affect the number in the long term can really help show that like you're good at math, that you can think things ahead and that you understand the implications of how you play around with the numbers. Yeah. And the third tip that we want to bring up is breaking numbers into parts. And so what I mean by that is when you're multiplying something by 15, for example, one really easy way to do it is like multiply the number by 10, multiply it by five, and then just add the two together. And that way you make it much easier than trying to think about, oh, what's, I don't know, 16 times 15, right? Like doing 16 times 10, that's 160, 16 times five, that's half of 160, which is 80. And then you add those two together. So 160 and 80, that's 240. So if you do it that way, I think it's much faster and it shows the interviewer that you can handle numbers really easily. Mm -hmm. And one thing that we recommend, if you don't already know it, is to brush up on your multiplication tables at least yeah. to 10. Uh, because yeah. if you know that, it'll really, really help you quicken up in terms of ma mental math skills. And there are many fun ways that you can implement learning mental math beyond just the multiplication tables. One way that I did this was by playing poker. I don't recommend that everyone does this. <laughs> yeah, definitely not. Um, but in poker, there's a lot of things where you have to do quick mental math. But there are many other ways like downloading a mental math app uh, or challenging your friends or things like that that you can implement in order to get faster at mental math. And I promise it'll pay like huge dividends in the casing process. For sure. I think this is only a habit using a mental math app or something that you only need to do for a couple weeks before you can start seeing results. And of course, if you're lucky enough like Rohit to have a hobby like poker or whatever it might be that can have you doing math all the time, that, that's great as well. And then the fourth and last trick that we wanted to mention is actually a trick that I think I think really only I use. I, I've told this to other people and they found it useful, but I don't know if they've actually went and implemented it. Um, and I don't think, Rohit, you probably don't use this trick too much. Maybe I shouldn't yeah. be telling you all that, but <laughs> it's okay. So this trick involves multiplying and dividing with certain numbers that come up a lot. So 25 and five. So whenever I have to multiply something with 25, 
instead of multiplying by 25, I instead add two zeros to the number and then divide by four. Because multiplying by 100 and then dividing by four is the same thing as multiplying by 25. So for example, if I'm trying to do, I don't know, 25 times 18, what I'll do is I'll take that 18 and then I'll add two zeros to it. So 1800 and then divide by four, which I know 18 divided by four is 4.5. So it's gonna be 450. So that's, that's one way that I like handling 25s. And then you can do the same thing when dividing. If you're dividing something by 25, what you can do is take off two zeros from the number and then multiply by four. I'll use 450 again as, as the same example. So if you're dividing 450 by 25, um, what you can do is take out two zeros and then multiply by four. So you know 450 divided by two zeros is 4.5 and then times four, you know, 4.5 times two is nine and then just multiply nine again by two and that's 18. And these examples, I feel like it probably wasn't the best, but of course this is something that we're just telling you is some a tool that you can use and, and it's up to you to really figure out when makes the most sense for you to use it. And then the other one, which is regards to five, I think this one's gonna be more useful, but it's when you're multiplying by five, instead of actually multiplying by five, just multiply the number by 10 and then cut it in half because multiplying by 10 and then dividing by two is the same thing as multiplying by five. So I, I don't know, I'll just pick a random number, 81. Like if I wanted to multiply 81 by five, I would take 810, which is 81 times 10, and then divide by two, which is 405. So that's how that works. And then in reverse, of course, you, whenever you're dividing by five, instead you just take off a zero and then multiply by two. So that one I use pretty frequently, the 25 one, maybe a little less frequently, but hopefully those help as well. And I'm curious as well, if you have any math tricks that we didn't cover, please let us know down below because I'm sure that there are so many other math tricks that people have found out or that they use regularly that could be really helpful to everyone else. So I'll be looking forward to seeing those in the comments. Thanks everyone. We hope you enjoyed the video and we hope you found it helpful on why math is important in consulting and also maybe the specific guidelines and tricks that we mentioned are helpful. If you found anything that was unclear or if you have feedback for us, definitely drop it down below in the comments. And also if you'd like to see any videos in the future, drop those down in the comments too. And finally, if you like the video, you know, please like it on YouTube as well. <laughs> yeah, um, it definitely helps our channel and uh, it helps the YouTube algorithm. Yeah, and definitely also helps our egos because we're doing this for free. So having <laughs> likes is kind of the only, we're not getting any money for this. So <laughs> having likes helps too. So anyway, thanks y'all. Awesome. And thanks. see y'all in the next video.